All right, good evening, everybody. It's good to see you in God's house tonight. I feel like I'm leaning this way. Dwayne, y'all might have to come on over here, I guess. <laughs> no, it's good to see y'all and uh, glad to have everybody here tonight. If y'all want to stand, we're going to sing one hymn of praise. Have faith in God, and we'll do uh, however many verses is in that computer. I don't remember. <laughs> and knows all the way you have tried never alone are the least of his children have faith in God have faith in God have faith in God he's on his throne have faith in God he watches o'er his own he cannot fail He'll answer yes. Have faith in God. He's on his throne. Have faith in God. He watches o'er his own. He cannot fail. He must prevail. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. That must be it. <laughs> Thank y'all. Y'all can be seated. You know, when the song's over, you run out of slides. Ain't got nothing else left to say. But uh, it's good to be in the Lord's house tonight. And uh, glad you're here for a Wednesday night Bible study and prayer meeting. Have you had a good week? Amen. You glad you made it to Wednesday? We halfway to Sunday. And Saturday's coming. That'll get us to Saturday. Praise the Lord. And uh, so many things are going on. We got Bible school kick off a kids fun night going on tonight and uh, continuing our series and the foundations of our faith that we started several weeks back and uh, just excited about all the things that are going on. Uh, make a few prayer requests and take a few prayer requests and uh, make some announcements on some things that are going on. Um, tomorrow at one o'clock we'll be having Miss Dolly Broom's funeral and it'll be just a graveside service at Union Memorial Gardens and uh, so that'll be tomorrow at 1 o'clock there and then tomorrow night at 6 the Building and Grounds Committee will be having a meeting here at the church at 6 o'clock tomorrow night so if you're on that committee please be here and uh, talk with or didn't talk with Jimmy Williams but got an update on him this morning that um, supposed to get the pathology report back on him uh, Friday so they're waiting to see kind of what's going on he's still in the hospital as of this afternoon I hadn't heard anything else but uh, they're trying to see how he can you know, maintain the, there at the hospital before they'll send him home. So they hadn't totally cleared him yet for that. And I talked to uh, Brother Delis earlier today. He got the report back from his MRIs yesterday and uh, found out he has had a couple mini strokes and has got a cluster of tumors on his brain. So they don't know exactly what's going on or kind of what those, the results of those are. But um, he's going to be going to the doctor over the next few days and trying to, to figure out a course of action and uh, remedy, see what they can and can't do. Um, so that's as much as we know at this point on him. I told him we'd be praying for him tonight, that I'd share that information with the church, and he was thankful for that. Um, I talked to Miss Donna Snedden earlier today, too. She asked us to, to keep Jerry in our prayers. He had to have 17 teeth removed today. So the only thought he was going to have to have two removed. So you can imagine what uh, pain that he's in tonight and discomfort. Um, so I said we will definitely be praying for him. So keep Jerry Snedden in your prayers. I know they'd certainly appreciate that. He's going to be uh, loving life, I guess you could say, over the next few days, probably weeks. Um, so definitely keep him in your prayers. I know they would appreciate that. She says he's got a mouth full of stitches. I said I would assume so, having all that done. But uh, told him that we'd definitely be praying for that. Uh, deacons will have our deacons meeting on Sunday at 9 o'clock. And um, 
I think that's all the announcements that we got going on. I know Bible school is going to continue for the next five, five Wednesdays. So we're excited about that. Our kids are going to be uh, learning and uh, growing, and we're excited for them. And um, I talked with uh, the pastors last Thursday. We had a pastor's meeting about the tent revival that's happening down here uh, this summer. And we have a tent to use uh, for free. Uh, we're going to end up having to spend probably $3,000 for a tent to rent this summer. But God provided and made a way we got one for free. So we give God the praise and glory for that. And excited about all that's going to happen in that meeting. So you continue to pray for us that we would seek the Lord's face and seek his wisdom and guidance for that meeting. And uh, just cannot wait to see what all the Lord is going to do. Does anybody have any prayer requests they want to mention tonight? Raise your hand. Leo, get you a microphone. We want to make sure everybody hears. Has anybody got any prayer requests tonight that's on your heart? It's good to not have any prayer requests. Not, not, a, whole lot, not a whole lot bad going on, so that's, that's, a, that's good. Uh, we're glad, like I said, we're glad you're here tonight. And uh, Hank, will you open us in a word of prayer tonight, please, sir, as we open, go into God's word? Amen. So tonight we're going to continue. This is chapter or session number five, if you will, in our, uh, sub, in our study of uh, foundational truths that we have to anchor our faith in. We started kind of give you a, a, a recap of where we've got to this point so far. We started uh, with looking at the sinner's condition before salvation, that man was not born into a relationship with God. Man was born at war. Uh, and at enmity with God. We were separated from God's love, and uh, the only way that we could have that bonded together was through a relationship with Jesus Christ. And then the second week, we learned about what happens at salvation. Now the moment that we're saved, we're 100% justified by the blood of Jesus. Our sins are washed away, and we're a new creature that's created in Christ Jesus. And then we looked at, uh, we looked at what... Um, the ministry of the local church is, is we're to preach the word of God. We're to go into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in. This is, like I said last week, this is supposed to be a hospital for sinners. This should not be a place where people come in, feel judged, feel separated, feel secluded. But this ought to be a place of welcome. This ought to be a place where uh, sinners can walk in and feel love, feel the love of Jesus Christ on them. And that's our prayer uh, is the church is to be a lighthouse, be a beacon of hope in this community. That's the ministry of the local church. And tonight, I want to look at the, the witness responsibility. So now we know what my lost condition was. Now if I'm saved, I know what happened the day I got saved. I know what change has been made in my life. Now I found out what my church's responsibility is. But what about me as a personal Christian? What about me? I know what the church itself is supposed to do, but what am I supposed to do? What's my responsibility? Number one, it's to be a part of a local New Testament church. It, we talked about that last week. It's a blessing and a encouragement that we are to be uh, in the house of God. It said, not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. But as you see the day approaching, we ought to be together more and more as we see everything that's going on. But the responsibility of the witness, what is our responsibility tonight? Can I say God gave you the greatest gift that's ever been given? It's not a million dollar check. It's not uh, a prize. It's not anything of material value. But the best thing that has ever been given to mankind is the gift of salvation. You can't price. The only thing you can price that at is heaven's best. 
God sent heaven's best when nothing else would have worked to pay for the sins of not just the church, but the entire world if they would just receive the free gift of salvation. So after Christ rose, he gave instructions to his disciples. In John chapter number 20 and verse 21, Jesus said, this is words of Jesus. He said, as my father has sent me, so send I you. He said, I'm not the only one who's supposed to come and preach this new gospel. And when I ascend back to heaven, you know, everybody else is supposed to just figure it out. He said, the same way that my father sent me, he was sent from glory. We know in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost was present there before the world was ever created. And in that plan, when God created the entire world, he knew that Adam and Eve would sin in the Garden of Eden. In the foreknowledge of God, God knew in his heart, God knew in his mind, man's not able to keep the commandments that God's given to him. So he knew that there would have to be a substitute. There would have to be a sacrifice to pay for the sins of the entire world. So before the world was ever created, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost orchestrated the plan of salvation and gave the free gift that he knew Michael wasn't going to be able to pay the sin debt. Gabriel wasn't going to be able to pay the sin debt. But the only one worthy and capable to pay for the sins of the entire world was the Son of the living God. So God the, God the Father sent God the Son into this world, was born of a virgin. I still believe that. Uh, scientists may try and disprove it and they may try to contradict it, but we trust the Bible. We don't trust scientists. We know scientists say you have to have water to live. That's right. Jesus said, I'll give you living water that you never thirst again. They say, you've got to have bread to live. And that's right. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Uh, science proves that Jesus is alive. Scientists prove that God's word is true. But God sent Jesus Christ to be born of a virgin in Bethlehem, Judah, uh, about 2,000 years ago. And he lived a perfect life for 33 years died on the cross for the sins of the entire world. And before he ascends back to the Father, he tells those disciples, the same way that the Father has sent me to this earth, I'm sending you with the same message, with the same gospel, to preach the same message of salvation to whoever will listen to it. It's not just for a select group. It's not just for a select few. But the Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. I'm thankful it's not a, it's not a whoever win, but it's a whoever will gospel tonight. That if they would just accept that free gift, they would be redeemed and sanctified and justified through the blood of Jesus Christ. So look what it says. God promises the Holy Spirit will guide and empower you as you share the gospel. I can have a conversation about baseball and I don't get nervous about that. I could have a conversation about North Carolina Tar Heels. I'm unapologetic about that. I'm a Tar Heel fan born. Some of y'all shaking your head no. I don't care what it, I don't care what you got to say. We got six national championships and we're going for a seventh next season, praise God. I can talk about baseball, I can talk about basketball, and I love to eat. If y'all hung around me long enough, y'all know I love to eat. Baptists love to eat, especially Baptist preachers, praise God. We got to have them eating meat and to go over anything nowadays. But I can talk about anything. But the one thing I get nervous about is somebody's relationship with Jesus Christ. When I'm presenting the gospel to somebody, I can, it's crazy. I can get up here and preach to 500 or 5,000 people. I'm still nervous, but I ain't near as nervous if I'm talking to you one-on-one. -on -one. You know, why, why do we get nervous about that? Why do we get anxious? You know, that anxiety begins to swell up in you and your blood, your face starts to get red and your heart begins to beat out of your chest and you feel like, you know, what is, what is going on? Because you're handling somebody's eternity in the palm of your hand. When you're presenting the gospel to somebody and you're telling them about a relationship with Jesus Christ, that's nerve-wracking. And it should be. It shouldn't be something that's lackadaisical. It shouldn't be something that we just ho-hum about. But no, when I'm talking and witnessing to somebody, that's the most important thing I can talk to them about. It's not, kid, where are you going to go to college? It's not what kind of car are you going to drive? It's not what kind of job you're going to have. What will you do with Jesus? That's the most important question that anybody's ever going to have to answer. And think about this. Once you lay that foundation, once you sow that seed into their life, it's not up to you any longer. It's not up to you any further. He said, sow the seed, God giveth the increase. I'm glad. It's not based off my doing. It's not based off how I live my life for somebody else to receive the gift of salvation. It's my job to plant the seed. It's my job to sow and to give the word of God. And God will give the increase. It's up to that person either to receive or reject the gift of salvation. I can't choose for somebody to make that choice, but they have to make the decision 
on their own. And we're supposed to do that. That is our responsibility that God has given us. You say, how am I going to be able to share the gospel? How am I going to be able to share the, the good news of Jesus Christ? The Holy Spirit will help you. The Holy Spirit will give you what you need. See, I've talked to people sometimes after they had witnessed to somebody, and I was talking to them, and I said, how, how did it go? They said, well, I started off the conversation, and then I said Jesus, and then I don't remember what else I said. Or, you know, somewhere along the way, they forget everything that they said. There have been, can you believe it or not, there have been sermons I preached. I couldn't tell you what in the world I preached. I had to go back and watch a live stream just to figure out where I went. Some Sundays I get on that outline and I get off of it and ain't got a clue where in the world I went. But I'm knowing that God's leading me. God's directing me in the way I should go. And when you witness to somebody and you spread the gospel with somebody, God will give you the words that you need to say. God will give you the direction that you need to go. If you say, what if I mess it up? Throw Jesus in the conversation. That takes care of about all of it. As long as you get Jesus in the conversation, you can't mess Jesus up. I don't care what you do. I don't care how many times you stutter or fumble over your words. I stutter and fumble over my words every Sunday and Wednesday. But I know I'm preaching Jesus. He said, thy word will not return void. If you do what God's asked you to do, I don't care how many times you mess up. I don't care how many times you make a mistake. God's word will not return void. God will accomplish the mission that he has set out. But it's up to us to follow the commandment. It is us to give the good news of the gospel. We see in Acts chapter number 1 and verse number 8. But ye shall receive power. You know, we all have got power tonight. Some of us think we ain't got near as much power as we got. But we've got power tonight. Through the not through my name, not through this church's name, but through that name that's given above every name, that name whereby we must be saved. Through Jesus Christ, we have power tonight. But after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. He said, don't stay where you're at. But you've got to spread it all throughout the entire world. And what did we find out? We was looking at Romans a few weeks ago. In Romans chapter number 1, it said that your faith has been known throughout the entire world. What is that? The faith that the church at Rome had, their faith was so broadcast and so expounded because of how strong and their witness was for the cause of Christ. I wonder how many people would say, I know about that church at Lockhart's faith. I mean, they got big, big faith tonight because of what their witness is and what their example is and how they're willing to share the gospel to whoever they come in contact with. But we have been given power. We shall receive power when the Holy Ghost came down. We find out in Acts chapter number 2 where the Holy Spirit came down and 3,000 got saved on the day of Pentecost. Wouldn't it be something if I was preaching on Sunday and the Holy Ghost come down and saturated this place and 3,000 souls got born again into the family of God? I long for days when God just begins to bless us and begin to move on us like he did a couple Sundays ago. But we will receive power and you and I tonight after we have been indwelt with the Holy Spirit Spirit of God, the moment that we got saved, as soon as you go and witness to somebody, can I say you ought to pray about it first? Before you go witness to somebody and you go begin to tell somebody about Jesus Christ, the best thing you can do is pray before you do it. Say, God, I can't do this in my own power. God, I can't do this in my own ability. But Lord, I know you want to help me. I know you want to give me what I need. And I'm trusting and I'm believing that you're going to give me what I need to say. And God will step in the conversation and say, if you'll just be obedient to what I have to say, I'll lead and guide and direct your steps. But we've got power tonight. Sometimes we haven't touched into the power that we've got. We think that God can never use me. God can never bless me. God will never give me the words to say. So I'll just stay comfortable. I'll just stay complacent in my salvation, in my Christianity. And I won't step out of my box. The best thing God could do is convict us so bad that we're forced to step outside of our box. That's the problem with most churches nowadays. We don't want to get outside of our comfort zone. We know God's got us saved and God's got us sanctified. We're awaiting glorification. And we don't want God to get us anywhere out of that perfect circle. But the best thing we can do sometimes is say, Lord, give me one opportunity today to witness to somebody. Give me one person that I come in contact with today that I can share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when that opportunity knocks, Lord, help me have the faith to step out of the comfort zone. Lord, help me have enough faith that I'll take a step out on the water in faith that, God, you're going to give me what I need to share the gospel with this individual. But we find out we're going to, uh, we see this, this is how it was described, and I think it's great. The gospel, witnessing is a beggar telling another beggar where he found bread. 
That's how I got in. Somebody told me about the good news of the gospel. I was given the opportunity. Somebody thought enough about me to say there is bread of life. There is living water. There is an eternity after you leave this world. And what will you do with Jesus? Somebody told me where I could find bread. And it's not up to me just to hold that. But I'm supposed to go tell somebody else where they can find that bread. Just from one beggar to another. Telling them about where they found bread. And I'm thankful it's so simple a child can understand it. Even as five or six or seven year old kids, the gospel is so simple, even children can get it. Jesus said, suffer ye the little children, come unto me. It's so, we have to come to Jesus with childlike faith. So many times today, people, especially older people, they overcomplicate the gospel. And they think because of what I've done and because of where I've been and because of what has happened to me, there's no way Jesus will accept me. There's no way that Jesus can save me. He just said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And we so complicate that gospel so many times. But we need to get back to, he said, for whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's described as a beggar telling another beggar where he found bread. And I'm thankful it's so simple that children can understand that truth. And I'm going to define a couple uh, words real quickly and we'll move on. What does the word soul winning mean? It means personally sharing the good news of salvation with the lost. We've thrown out soul winning a lot nowadays. There ain't many churches left that practice soul winning anymore. What's this right here? A track? When I come, I didn't see any in the church. But we got them now. So now you ain't got an excuse. We got, hun- we got hundreds of tracks back there in the, in the back. You ought to go pick you up some on the way out tonight. What is this? Say, I don't know what in the world to say. This says it for you. Say, God loves you and he wanted me to give you this. If you got any questions, here's my number. Please give me a call. I'd be happy to talk with you. Say, I don't know, I don't know if I could ever do that. I don't know if I could ever say the right thing. This has got the word of God. This is all you need. The word of God's all we need, friend. Because it does the rest. It does the job. But we ought to be students of the Word of God. When somebody's got a question, we ought to be able to give an answer for what we believe. Say, why do you believe that? We better be ready. If we're going to share the gospel with somebody, we better be ready to answer some questions. I've had people, answer, I've had people ask me questions. They said, is it true that you can be saved and not go to heaven? I've had that question asked. I said, no. They said, it's in the Bible. I said, book and page. Please, show me. And I'll answer that. I'll, I'll, I'll retract my statement. But I said, there's no way you can be saved and miss what you've been saved from. But there's going to be questions that people are going to ask you. Say, could God love me? If he loved Paul, he could love me. If he could love Peter, he could love me. If he could love Jonah, he could love me. There's nobody God does not love tonight. Because he sent his son to die for the entire world. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. He loved the drug addict. He loved the murderer. He loved the adulterer. He loved everybody who's ever been born. That's why he sent his son to die for whosoever will may come. But it's up to us to be a soul winner for Jesus Christ. Number two, what is a witness? It is a Christian who tells others about what Jesus Christ has done in his life. Not only can you give them the word of God. If you can't give them the word of God, my goodness, tell them what Christ has done for you. That's the best testimony you can ever give somebody. Is tell, tell somebody that I can't give you the Bible. I can't give you the entire word of God. But I can tell you that I was a sinner lost on my way to hell without God. In one day I had an encounter with Jesus and he changed my entire world. Turned my life around and now I'm heaven bound with the hammer down and there's nothing that can change that. Nothing can separate me from the love of God. Tell them what Jesus has done for you. That's the best thing we can tell somebody. You know, I can relate to you better in different ways than you can. There's some, there's some guys that y'all can relate to I can never relate to. They'll never listen to me in a million years. But if you've been changed, if you've been changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ, you've been saved by the blood of Calvary, you can reach people I'll never reach. You can reach people I never reach. In our lines of work, in our places of business that we go to, you've got a mission field that God has planted you. You think you work that job on accident? No, God directs our steps. God orders our life. It's our job to walk in that path. And it's our job to follow the will of God. But God directs and God moves and God guides and God leads. It's our job to walk in that. And you didn't just work that job on accident. 
God's placed you there for a specific time, for a specific purpose, for a specific reason. But it's up to us to be a soul winner and a witness for the cause of Christ. I wonder how many of us have shared the gospel with somebody we work with recently. When's the last time you told somebody what Jesus did for you? Can I say not as often as I should? I mean, they ain't no, I mean, Miss Ann works here with me during the week. She say she told me she's saved. Now, I'm just kidding. She's she said so. I can't really witness to her about her salvation. She's already saved. But I go to the gas station. We all pump gas, even if it's five, six dollars a gallon. Lord help us. We need something. But we all see people at the gas station. We all see people at our places of work. We run into people. You you go to McDonald's. You go to McDonald's. You come to that lady at the drive-through. You interact with people all the time. Say, I don't know what in the world to say. How's your day going? That's the most common question nobody likes to ask anymore because we're not sure what we're going to get. If you go through the drive-thru, they're short-staffed, they're low on workers, and they're low on employees. They're just ready to get to 9 o'clock and go home. But how's your day going? I just wanted you to know Jesus loves you. Take time to read this sometime today. If you got any questions, here's my number on the back. Give me a call. I'd love to talk to you anytime. I can't do that. God said, I'll give you the spirit of power. I'll give you the power of the word of God. God will give you what you need. Try it one time. Say, what, if, what, if, what has happened when you've done that? I've had doors slammed in my face. I've had people say, I don't want nothing to do with that. You never know what you're going to get. But then there's sometimes you give that to them and they... See a tear roll down their eyes. You see tears begin to roll down their face. Say, I really needed that today. I had people when I was working at the bank. This will convict you. I had people when I was working at the bank, they'd come through the drive-thru. If I'd have had a rough customer right before or something, they'd come through the drive-thru and they'd push a track through and they'd say, Jesus loves you. I wonder what look I had on my face right before they seen me. But somebody thought, regardless of what he's going through, they decided that they're going to follow what God told them to do and give me that. There's no telling not just what, so, what lost person might be touched, but there's no telling what Christian may be struggling, be ready to throw in the towel and quit on God that one encouragement might change their direction. We're not just supposed to be a witness for lost people. We're supposed to witness for our brothers and sisters in Christ. We're supposed to uplift one another. We're to bear one another's burdens. We're supposed to be a witness and a load bearer for our brothers and sisters in Christ. There's no telling what God will do when we be the faithful witness. And you say, well, I'm supposed to tell them what the gospel is. I'm supposed to share the good news. What is the gospel? The gospel is the good news that Christ died, Christ was buried, and he rose again the third day and has forgiven our sins. What can you tell him? Jesus Christ came. He died on the cross. He was buried in a grave. And three days later, he rose by his own self and now ascended back to heaven. And if you just believe and, and, and trust in that, that he would redeem you and would save you from your sins, you can be saved. That's the gospel in a nutshell. That's all you got to tell him. Not in those exact words. It's not in exactly what you say. But if you're, here's the thing. If you would just be the slightest obedient to what God's told you to do, there's no telling what mountains God will move in your life. There's no limits. There's no boundaries. There's no telling what God will do. If we just be obedient in the small things God has asked us to do. So what is our responsibility as a witness? We are to go teach all nations about Christ. It's not just for right here. Now we ought to start right here. We ain't got no business going across the world if we ain't starting our own Jerusalem. He said you've got to start in Jerusalem first. We get our community saved, then we go outside of our community. We ought to start right here. There's enough people within five-mile radius of this church that need the gospel preached to them. I, I love international missions. Thank God for them. It's a, it's a calling for them to go across the world and do that. I couldn't go spend my whole world in a tent for two or three years across the world in the desert somewhere, not have any cell phone reception, not have any Dr. Pepper or Coca-Cola or nothing like that, no fried chicken. But that's a calling God has sent people to do. Thank God for it because I couldn't do it. But you know what? If I've put all my stuff into going across the world, my community's lost, that's on me. That's on me. You know what we ought to start first? Make sure our household's right with God. Before we go outside our house, we ought to make sure our house is right. We ought to make sure our family's right, our unit's right. I heard a person say this. It'd be something to gain the whole world 
and lose your own family. If I got the whole world saved and my family was lost and died and went to hell, that'd be terrible. That'd be awful. But he said, we've got to start in our own Jerusalem. Think about this. Somebody shared Jesus with you. Can you remember the day you got saved? If you remember the day you got saved, raise your hand. You remember that person that told you about Jesus, don't you? Somebody thought enough and loved you enough to tell you about a man named Jesus. Don't hog it. Don't keep that to yourself. Because they shared it with you so you could share it with somebody else. We are commanded by the Bible to tell others about heaven and salvation. How do we know that? It's, your, it's not whether you like it or not. It's a commandment by God to be a witness. Now, I laid those definitions out and you say, well, that's good, preacher, but I ain't got to. Here's your explanation. This is where the Bible tells you this is what you've got to do. Look at Matthew chapter number 28 and verse 19 through 20. The last verses in the book of Matthew. He says in verse 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. You say, how in the world is God going to give me what I need to witness to somebody? God said, I'll be right there with you. You're not witnessing by yourself. You're not being a soul winner by yourself. You've got God on your side. Even if the church forsakes you, even if you're standing by yourself in front of somebody, you've got the God of heaven on your side. We're on the winning side tonight. Because you know we've read the back of the book. We win. We've, we found out that we win in the end. So why don't we win a few more battles on the way, praise God. But we've got God on our side with us. Go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. He said, I'll be with you for forever. When Jesus ascended off the Mount of Olives, went back to heaven, he said, or in his uh, last supper with his disciples, he sat in that upper room with me. He said, boys, I'm getting ready to go home. He said, I'm getting ready to go back where I come from, but I won't leave you comfortless. He said, I will send another comforter that he'll be with you. Now, once you've been saved, you don't have Jesus with you. He's not physically here, but you've got the Holy Spirit living on the inside. You've got the conviction. You've got the power, that same power that rose Jesus Christ from the dead and living on the inside with you. That's that same power, that same spirit that we have. But then we look in Matthew chapter number 4 and verse 19. Look at what it says. It says, and he saith unto them, follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. Not only are we to go and teach all nations about Christ, but we're to be fishers of men. That's our job. That's our responsibility. Is to go. How do we do that? We go and witness and we go soul winning and we go telling others about the good news of the gospel. Very few things last for eternity, but the souls of men do in heaven or hell. All these kids that are playing t-ball right now and baseball and all this other stuff, there's a slim chance they're going to play pro baseball. But there's a 100% chance they're going to stand before God one day and give an account for what they've done with Jesus in their life. I mean, we, like, we think our kids are going to do all these things and I love sports and all that stuff, but the most important thing that ought to be in their life is what have they done with Jesus. It's not about what you've heard about Jesus. It's what kind of relationship do you have with Jesus. That's the most important thing that they'll ever have to answer. And when they get to heaven, they'll have to say, Well, Mom and Daddy took me to church, and I listened to the preacher, and I was in Sunday school, and I was in VBS, and I was in Awana, and I can quote the Bible. And I know John 3.16. He said, Yay, but depart from me, your workers of iniquities. I never knew you. It's not about what you know. It's about who you know. And it's about that you know him is what makes the difference. But we're to go and to be fishers of men. He said, follow me. Drop what you're doing. Leave everything behind. If you're going to be a disciple, it's going to cost you something. If you're going to be a witness, if you're going to be a soul winner, if you're going to be the witness that God has called you to be, you're going to have to sacrifice some stuff. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be, it's not going to be glamorous either. It's not the high life, and it's not mountaintops all the time. There's going to be some valleys you've got to walk through. But he already said in Matthew chapter number 28, he said, I'll be with you always, even to the ends of the world. God will be there with you every single step of the way. He said, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Can I say, like he's still doing today, he's still got us on that potter's wheel. 
He's still forming us. He's still fashioning us. He's still making us into the fishers of men that He wants us to be. And every time that we witness to somebody and every time that we talk to somebody, it's a growing step. It's a part of that sanctification and growing process that we're still going through. He's still molding and making me. But I'm thankful that every time I get an imperfection or there's something that comes into my life that should not be there, He doesn't throw the clay away, but He puts it back on the wheel and begins to mold and to make that clay again. But we are supposed to be fishers of men. It's our responsibility after we're saved, first of all, is to tell others about Jesus Christ. That's our entire responsibility, is to tell everybody about somebody that's changed us. And why are we supposed to be fishers of men? I like this one, because we are entrusted with the gospel. You got, you're, load, you're armed and loaded, friend. Once you're saved, once you're changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ, you are loaded with all of heaven's artillery. How do you know that? Because number one, we know we got the Holy Spirit living on the inside. We got God in the flesh living on the inside of us. And we're given the most important message in the world. Can I ask you, how are you using it? I mean, how good of a job are we doing with what God has already given us? We're entrusted with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2 and verse 3 through 4. For the exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile, but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel. We were entrusted with the gospel. When God saved you, God never saved anybody for no purpose. God never saved one person to just sit on a church pew and sit on a church seat and just soak it in and soak it in and never give anything out to anybody. He never saved anybody for that. But He saved every person who's ever been saved for a reason. Not everybody's called to preach. Not everybody's called to sing. Not everybody's called to be a missionary. But we all have a calling, and that is to be a witness and a soul winner for Jesus Christ. What do I have? You are entrusted with the gospel. You have been given the ammunition. You've been locked and loaded with the Bible, and God has given you the words that you need to say. If we'll just be obedient to what God has given us, He's entrusted us with everything that we need. Can I say you've got everything that you need right now to be a soul winner? After you've been saved, you don't need nothing else. You don't need a new revelation. You don't need a, a, a form of facade or anything like that. You don't need an emotional moment. If you're saved, you've been indwelt with the Holy Spirit, and you've got the faith as the grain of the mustard seed, and God will give you what you need. You've just got to step out in faith and believe that God's going to give you everything that you need. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing men. I'm not here to please men. If y'all ain't figured that out in 10 months, you, I, I better settle it on Wednesday night. I'm not here to please men. I either please God or I please man. You can't do both. But if you please man, you're gonna be up, God's going to be upset with you. But if you please God, there's going to be some men, there's going to be some women that ain't going to like what you've got to say. And they're not going to like what you've got to stand for. But on the authority of the Word of God, I'm not here to please men. I'm not here to compromise. I'm not here to back up. I'm not here to go a separate direction. But I'm here to go forward as a preacher of the word of God to stand on what God's word said and say God is the final authority and I want to tell everybody that I know that Jesus saves. That's still the best song that's ever been sung. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. And I'm thankful for that old song that says I'm thankful he still saves old sinners. I'm thrilled and amazed that he sets them free. And But the biggest surprise in redeeming old sinners is that he would save an old sinner like me. Thank God he still saves tonight. If God wasn't still in the saving business, let me give you some news. We wouldn't be here. If God was done saving people, we'd be in heaven right now. But while the church of the living God is still on planet earth, we've got a responsibility. We've got a job to do. And it's up to the church. It ain't up to the world to save the world. It's up to the church to save the world and to be a witness for Jesus Christ. Not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. Salvation simple. How simple is it? We're all sinners. We're all sinners. Don't matter who you talk to, every person you come in contact with is a sinner. There's nobody ever been born who's not one. 
But since Adam failed in the Garden of Eden, sin has been running rampant in each and every individual that has ever been born. Not only are we all sinners, but thank God Christ died on the cross because He loved us, John 3, 16. And then the third part of that, we may accept God's gift of eternal life by trusting in Him. For with the mouth confession is made, but with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. I'm thankful we've got to admit that we're a sinner. We've got to believe that Jesus died on the cross and resurrected again, and then we receive the free gift of salvation. Now we have eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. I'm glad that the gospel is simple tonight. Because if it wasn't simple, I'd have missed it. How simple is it? It's so simple that Tate as an eight-year-old boy can get it. It's so simple that me as a seven-year-old boy can get it. It's so simple as as Brandon, an eight-year-old boy, he can get it. But I'm glad it's still so simple that a 92-year-old lady sitting on her deathbed can still receive the free gift of salvation. I'm glad the thief on the cross who is in his dying hour is still so simple that he trusted and he looked and said, Father, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said, Verily, truly I say unto you, today you shall be with me in paradise. The gospel is simple. God, help us not complicate it. The gospel is so simple. It's still up to us to be a witness. It's still up to us to follow the commandments that God has given unto us. So what is our witness responsibility? It's to go and teach all nations. But Lord, heaven, help us. Let's start where we are. Let's not go to Samaria. Let's not go to Judea when we've not started at Jerusalem. This is, can I tell you what? Within two or three miles from around this place, this is our Jerusalem. That town right there is still our Jerusalem. Everywhere around us, we have a Jerusalem. And God, help us reach it. God, help us preach to it. Help us teach it that there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shine. I've heard, I've heard this, and I used to agree with it, and now I'm kind of backing up on it. I heard somebody say, we ought to preach God is love, and God is love, and God will accept, and God will accept. But God's also a God of judgment. You can preach God is love, and you can preach God will accept, but there's coming a day that door will be shut. There's coming a day when if we don't accept Jesus Christ and that person does not accept and receive that gift, they will die and be lost and go to hell for eternity without God. We can preach God's love. We can preach God will accept. But we also got to preach. You got to make a decision. It's not about what you've heard. It's about what you put your faith and trust in. It's up to each person. You got to make a choice. It's up to you. And there's no better day than to make the choice that day you hear it. It'll save you a long life of trouble. It'll save you a long life of heartache and disappointments. But I'm glad that it's up to each person. If they hear it, they can receive it. But I think the most difficult thing that we've done, and I've seen it all over the the Bible Belt, is we've taught our kids, repeat this prayer. You'll be saved. Read this verse. Repeat after me. and You'll be saved. But none can be saved unless the Spirit draw him. We've got them into thinking that now since I've repeated something, since I've said these exact words, since I'm in church on Sunday and in church on Wednesday, that I've got it all figured out and everything's right between me and God. But we've led them into a false sense of religion. And they got religion down pat. You know, they know when, to, when a preacher says stand up, they know when to stand up. They know how to read the verses on the screens and they know how to sing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a rich like me, but they've never went through that themselves. They've got religion down pat, but they have no relationship with God. I heard a preacher say this, I think B.R. Lakin said it one time, it's a long time ago. He said most of the church, he said probably 30 to 40% of the church is lost and, and don't know it. No, he said 30, 40% of the church is saved and the rest of it's lost. And they just don't know it. I wonder how many of us we're so caught up in going through the motions. And we know how to go through the rituals. We know how to go through this is what we do here. And this is when we sing this song. And this is when we give the offering. And this is that. But yet Monday through Saturday we have no relationship with God. We're religious hypocrites is what we are. We know how to go through the motions. Hear my heart. I'm not down to nobody. I'm not degrading anybody. I'm the chief of sinners just like Paul was. But I've got bad news to tell you. A religion will not work. A relationship is the only thing that will get you through. What is our job if we've really got a relationship and we've really been changed? It's up to us to make sure. Think about this. I've never had somebody that was saved. Me go witness to them and they got mad that I asked them about their salvation. 
They said, I'm glad you asked. It gives me an opportunity to tell what Jesus has done for me. But I've had some people who, I've had some church people. I've come up and asked them and said, are you saved? And boy, you want to talk about scolding, yelling, cuss before. That tells me who needs to get in the altar next, praise God. But I've never, if somebody asked, are you saved? Yes, I am. How do you know? Here's the best question. If you're going to witness to somebody, don't ask them if they're a Christian because nobody is lost anymore. Everywhere you look, everybody's a Christian. That's a, that's, I don't ask people, are you a Christian anymore? I don't ask that because everybody is, supposedly. But there's going to be few that enter in the gates of heaven, so I don't know how that works. I ask them, are you saved? And they say, yeah. So how do you know? Tell me. You know what I commonly get? Well, I go to church here. This is my pastor's name. That ain't what I asked you. Well, I read my Bible, and this, I know the Bible, and I went to Bible school, and I did this, and I did that. That's not what I asked you. How do you know you're saved? Can I say the only way that you know you're saved is you've had to come to the place where you realize you're lost. You'll never get somebody saved till they realize that they're lost. If they never think they need to be saved, they'll never get saved. But when, like that prodigal son, when he came to himself, when you see yourself dangling over hell to find out how lost you really are without God or His Son, then the Holy Spirit can indwell and can convict and can move in your heart and say, I remember when I was lost and I called on the name of Jesus to save my soul. And ever since that day, I've been saved. Can't get over it. Can't get out of it. Can't change it. That's how you know somebody's saved. It ain't got to be those exact words, but there ought to be something about when I was lost and I called on Jesus to save me. It's not about what we have done. It's about what He has done for us. Our witness responsibility. We all have got a job. Every one of us. There ain't a single person under the sound of my voice watching the live stream tonight. There is not a single person I'm looking at making eye contact with tonight that does not have a job to do for Jesus. Can I say there's no job too big, there's no job too small to do for the Lord. Me preaching ain't no greater than you talking to somebody at work tomorrow. It's all the same for Jesus Christ. There's no big victories. There's no small victories. Can I tell you, there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels over one sinner that comes to repent. When somebody gets saved, heaven throws a party. Heaven rejoices. Heaven shouts. Heaven says amen. Why? Because one sinner that was lost, that was headed for hell, now their eternity has been changed and now they're heaven bound and the devil has no power over them anymore. Heaven throws a party. And every time somebody gets saved in here, it makes me want to run, go out them doors, go out them doors, run two laps around this place, run back in, shouting the whole time. Why? Because there's another soul, one for Jesus. And nothing can ever change that. But it's up to us. We've got a responsibility. We've got a job. It's a big job. I found out there's no small jobs for Jesus. Everything that we do is big for Him. Even the small things we think about in our mind, it makes a difference in the kingdom of God. But think about this. When we go be a witness, we ought to be a good one that's setting a good example. I mean, we can't, think about this. We can't go to the drive through and yell at that lady in the drive-thru and say, here's a track, by the way. I've seen that. That don't work. That goes over like sour milk. But we ought to be a good example. We ought to set the right example. If we're inviting somebody to church, we ought to make sure we're, we are an ambassador for Christ. We did go over that. We are an ambassador for Jesus. We set the tone. We, when they look at us, they ought to see Jesus. They ought to know that's a child of God. That's a son of God. That is a child of the Most High God. Not based off what we say, but how we conduct our lives. This is what makes the difference. It ain't going to matter what you say. It's what you do is how they're going to look at you. It's how you interact with people. It's how we go throughout our lives is what people are going to look at. So once they figure out who we are and what we're about, then they'll listen. Sometimes you may pass that track and they may take it. And it may be a week or two weeks. They're going to watch you. Prepare. Prepare yourself. If you're going to give somebody a track, you better be ready to have your guard up. Because as soon as you do, the devil's going to jump on your back. 
He's going to get in your car. He's going to get in your workplace and make sure you lose your testimony to that person you witness to. I'm preaching it right. That's, what, that's exactly what the devil's going to do. We've got to be on guard. We've got to be the witness that we need to be. We need to be strong in our faith and strong in our Christian walk. That way we can be the witness God has asked us to be. We've got a witness responsibility. Go and teach all nations to be fishers of men. And remember this, we're entrusted with the gospel. God gave you a message. It's the greatest message that's ever been told. Greatest love story that's ever been written. Hallmark ain't got nothing on the Bible. Hallmark ain't got nothing on what Jesus has done. But it's still a message that we need to give. As we stand all over the sanctuary tonight, is there any word on anybody's heart, anything anyone wants to say or do before we dismiss and go home? Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you for that. Anyone else tonight? God's good. All the time. God's good. Be safe traveling home. Uh, I'm going to pray. We'll be dismissed. Remember Sunday. Deacon's meeting on Sunday morning at 9 o'clock. And uh, excited. You pray. Uh, can I ask you something? I don't ask you for a whole lot very often. But I want you to pray for me for Sunday's message. Uh, I've fought with it all week. And uh, I want to obey the Lord first and foremost. And um, I want you to pray for me that uh, my heart would be protected. And then I'll stay clear-minded and clear-focused on what God has asked me to do for Sunday. So pray for that, and uh, I'll greatly appreciate it. All hearts and minds clear. Lord, we come to you tonight. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the beautiful weather that you give us. I thank you for this time that we've had to be in your word and to uh, learn more about what our responsibility, not just as a church is, but as a personal uh, soul winner and a, a born again child of God. You saved us for a job. You saved us for a purpose. That's to tell others about what Jesus Christ can do for them. I pray that you would protect us as we go our separate ways. Keep everyone safe as they go home. And I pray that you bring us back on the Lord's Day on Sunday ready to worship you in spirit and in truth. And we'll be careful to give you the praise. We'll give you all the glory and all the honor for all that's done. We ask this, all these things in Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Good night. God bless you.